Hey everyone, welcome back to Crafts College. This is my ICC tips and tricks video from ages and also some general tips as well. First thing to mention though is that I forgot to mention in my previous video that I always put in the pinned comment on a video any updates to the video, things that were maybe incorrect or just updates to it that the community has now found or I found or someone else has found in terms of uh, new tips and tricks or like in the previous video, new updates to phase four bisque gearing. So there's already been a couple updates to that. I put a pin comment there. The pin comment will eventually expire for whatever reason with YouTube. And so then I have to repin it. Um, so just know if you don't see a pin comment, then maybe my comment is down somewhere in the comment section. I just haven't repinned it yet. Um, but yeah, that's what I always do. So always check the pinned comments before you have a, any kind of question or comment because um, maybe it's already answered there or something like that. Or if you're just watching the video, just always check that in case there's any updates because apparently, I mean, I don't know of any way. If you guys know a way, maybe you can let me know, but there's no way to edit a YouTube video. Uh, once it's uploaded, you either have to just take it down or you just basically have to re-upload a new one, okay? And so then you either have two videos or I'd have to delist that one. It's just never going to happen. We're never going to do that. So, uh, you know, this is like the only way I've found to be able to kind of just, quote unquote, edit the video. It just kind of is the way it is. So, yeah, check the pinned comment for this if you're watching this uh, after it's been released. And same with the Phase 4 BIS guide. Um, there's a couple updates there, so go check those out. And then the last thing to mention, I covered the Lich King Blink from the Valks uh, later on in this video, but know that there is going to be a separate video that's going to go a little more in-depth on that coming out after this one, so stay tuned for that. All right, with that, let's get started. For ICC, the spec you want to be is Fire TTW, and you can see it here, and I'll go into some reasons why you want to be Fire TTW and this spec specifically for ICC here in a second, but it goes without saying that if you need to provide the Arcane buff to your raid, then you should probably be Arcane, of course, but uh, outside of that, Fire TTW is just going to be better overall for magic absorption, and also for the movement in the fights, the cleave on the fights in uh, ICC, etc, etc, and also just the best spec overall for damage, as you saw from my Phase 4 BIS video with the mage spec comparison part of that video. So the reason we want to be Fire TTW is all those reasons, but the reasons we want to be this spec specifically is we want magic absorption, because magic absorption is just really good on many fights. Marogar, Lady Death Whisper, Fester Gut, Rot Phase, Professor Putricide, Blood Council, Blood Queen, Dreamwalker, Syndragosa, and Lich King. It's basically mandatory. You got to get this. And so if you go FFB, you're not going to be able to get this, okay? And then also range is really good for uh, Marigar, Lady Death Whisper, Sour Fang, depending on your positioning spread for the fight at least. And same with like Fester Guts, kind of depending on your raid's positioning. But uh, also really good for Press for Future Side, Blood Council, Blood Queen, like really good for Blood Council, I should say. Um, and then also Lich King, of course, Flame Throwing is really good on. So, uh, that's why you definitely want to have magic absorption and flame throwing, and which is kind of this spec, right? If you get spirit talents, then you're not going to be able to get flame throwing. Um, also, the fights are really long or a lot longer in ICC, so getting three out of three master of elements is really huge. If you ever have to evocate because you didn't get a point uh, in master of elements and you went two out of three instead of three out of three, you just hit your DPS by a lot. Okay, so. By getting 3 out of 3 and then preventing you from having to evocate on fights, that's a huge boost to your DPS. So I highly recommend 3 out of 3 Master of Elements and then just overall, this is what most all the other top mages that I've talked to, this is what they're going to be running. And you could tweak this a little bit depending on the fight, right? So for certain fights where you don't need the range, like if you're positioned closer on Sour Fang, then you could have a separate second TTW spec that instead of going 2 out of 2 flame throwing, it just goes 0 out of 2 and gets 3 out of 3 suited to the mind. You know, you could do you. Do you. you could also have a, a 1 spec, like for Sour Fang, you don't need magic absorption it's probably the only fight you don't need magic absorption i guess though um where instead of going two out of two you could go five out of five but that's a very minor thing right so um you you can tweak this depending on the fight if you really want to but just for an overall one spec for all the different fights this is definitely what i recommend And then for Arcane, I wasn't Arcane at all in ICC, so I kind of have to defer to what Philippe has put here. And it's also just what I would probably guess is the best as well. Like if I had to make up an Arcane spec, this is probably what I would go with. One little tweak that I'll talk about. But the main thing is that you do want Encanter's Absorption. There's a number of fights where you can use Encanter's Absorption on. And uh, of course also Frost Warding. So, you know, you want to pick up Encanter's Absorption and Frost Warding, which is pretty big for that. So you have to make some concessions. You also have to, of course, get Magic Absorption, even though we like Arcane Concentration for the DPS as arcane but um i just think overall this is probably the spec you need to go aoe isn't necessary on fights so this would be more uh just for trash damage and everything like that so giving up uh, ice shards isn't a big deal so i think this spec although the one tweak i would make is i would probably take out arcane barrage 
granted, there's a lot of movement in ICC where Arcane Barrage could be doing work, but I think it's a personal preference thing. I've seen, you know, Itty Boxy speed ran in uh, Alduar as Arcane without Arcane Barrage because I think it's a personal preference. If you get used to playing without Arcane Barrage, then I don't think you need it. But you do have to be good at playing without Arcane Barrage. Then you have to be really smart with your movement and your positioning so that you don't have to move much. Um, you blink and just immediately cast after the blink in order to uh, basically be doing good DPS with on fights with movement um, without Arcane Barrage. So it is kind of something where if you struggle with that, then it is probably worth it for you to pick up Arcane Barrage. But if you can make do without Arcane Barrage, then you can drop this and you can pick up one point in, in Magic Attunement. Because range is, like I said, really helpful in ICC. So having 30 yard range for all of ICC would be really annoying, I feel. Um, but obviously it's it's hard to give up some of these points, especially on the fights where IA is pretty big. Obviously on the fights where you don't need Encanto's Absorption, then you can get two out of two uh, Magic Attunement. I just gave up uh, one point in Encanto's Absorption as like uh, you could also just do maybe two out of three in Canter's Absorption and get two out of two Magic Attunement. Again, I haven't, I didn't play Arcane, um, so I'm not exactly sure what would be best. Um, if you're going to be giving the buff, the Arcane buff to your raid, and you're going to always be playing Arcane, then you could have two Arcane specs, I suppose. So you could have this one for the fights where they're in Canter's Absorption, and the ones where there is no in Canter's Absorption, you could just take these two points out of here completely, and you could pick up some other things like get five out of five Arcane Concentration and whatnot, or pick up Arcane Barrage. Um, whatever you want. I don't know. I I'm not exactly sure what's best, but something close to this, uh, I think, is going to be um, one of these two specs is, is going to be the best for Arcane. And finally, for FFB, again, I only recommend this if you're going to be, you know, just padding on trash or if you uh, want to go it for Lady Death Whisper or Dreamwalker. That's the only two fights I really recommend FFB. Um, and it's not even necessary, it's just if you want to I, I find it helpful for D dragon's breath as well as just for extra aoe damage and it's uh, longer there are longer fights as well so fp is nicer on the mana but that's about it um and so if you really want to have that spec for those fights then this is what i recommend it's just the standard ffp spec that also picks up fire starter but you only need the one point in fire starter right we don't necessarily need a tf2 so that way you can get three out of three precision but if you also don't need the hit if you have a lot of hit gear, you don't have better alternatives to that hit gear or something like that, you could drop the point in precision and go two out of two fire starter, but that's also a very minimal increase as well. So um, yeah, this is pretty much as the standard straightforward FFB spec. Okay, so Marigar is pretty easy. Uh, you need eight people to stand out in order for the fire to not cook the melee. Uh, the fire looks fiery, but it's actually frost damage. So if you're going to need to survive it for whatever reason, make sure you use Frost Ward and Arcane. You can use Frost Ward for eight cannons absorption procs. The line has to be, happens to be cast on you. Um, as range, make sure you swap to the bone spikes. And then range talent is great here to continue DPSing boss from the center of room during bone or storm, but that's about all there is for this boss. All right, for Lady Death Whisper, you can spell steal the Vampiric Might from Cult Fanatics for a DPS increase. Uh, counterspell the Cult Adherence Death Chill Bolt cast instead of their Curse cast. If you interrupt the Curse cast, they'll still be able to cast the Death Chill, so make sure you interrupt the Death Chill Bolt cast. And then DK Grips are also dispensed here for those. Um, use some kind of add-on for quick decursing, whether it's uh, click plus raid frames or decursive, because you need to be quick on decursing people's curses that they get, otherwise they're not able to cast anything. Um, set the boss on focus and have a focus counterspell macro ready in case you need to back up kick her frostbolt. I highly recommend Foji's weak aura for this where you can set the kick rotation and which kick you're on and it's just very helpful to then know uh, when you actually need to do a kick. For fire, it depends on your raid's AoE, but only Living Bomb 3-4 to four adds in Phase 1. If you Living Bomb any more, they'll probably die before the Living Bombs actually go off. Depends on your raid and strat though. And in phase two, move between each side of the room during instant cast CDs um, and when you have to move for ghosts so that when the ads spawn, you're right there ready to living bomb them and also to be able to help interrupt their casts. And FFB is great on this fight for mana because it can be a long fight. It also adds extra AoE damage to ensure the ads die before uh, mind control goes out. And it's also an extra interrupt on the ads through Dragon's Breath. Uh, which is, you know, it's just easier to grab Dragon's Breath, um, Blast Wave, and Fire Starter as FFB than it is as Fire TTW. So I recommend FFB here, not for a long time, you know, maybe just like during Prague or on the, your first few kills, but I think it can be helpful. And then for Arcane, you can Frost Ward off CD in Phase 2 for constant encounters absorption and Frost Warding procs, as Lady Death Whisper does Frost Bolt volleys every 20 seconds. For Sour Fang, this area counts as outside, so you can Cluster Launcher and Lucky Rocket for extra stand buff to the raid if you still happen to have those from Lunar Festival. 
and a hunter frost trap and a booby knockback should be all that's needed to ensure the ads die before they reach a player but if you need a little extra cc then i highly recommend frost weave nets if you're tailoring they cc the ad for three seconds and they can be used multiple times in a row from our testing on the ptr they have a one minute cd but they're off gcd and with all tailors having them uh, if ads make it out of the frost trap after a booby knockback then just toss one of these or multiple of these on an ad and finish it off once it reaches outside of that frost trap blood bees spawn every 40 seconds so you can time your living bombs to explode upon on blood bees spawn and while the blood bees take 95 percent reduced aoe damage the explosion is an almost guaranteed hot streak proc and that extra instant pyro can help ensure dpsing the ads down the best way to help ensure the timing on this is to living bomb sour fang as soon as your living bomb explodes on the ads and then from there you may have to delay a living bomb by a cast or two just watch your timers um, so that it lines up with exploding right when they spawn or a couple seconds after they spawn this does mean that you're now giving up a gcd during the ad phase in order to you know right away reapply living bomb to sour fang but the upside easily outweighs this due to the instant pyro and the higher uptime and damage on sour fang where your raid has to meet the dps check of the fight or you'll end up wiping and then lastly ice block to remove blood boil cast on you just to help out the raid for Vestergut, we can Ice Block to survive the Pungent Blight, and this means that we don't have to stack and get the Spore debuff. However, if a Spore is cast on you, you of course still need to go stack on others so that they can get the debuff. This boss is a DPS raise to beat Enrage Timer, so for top guilds, this isn't difficult in Phase 3 Biz, but it will be a DPS check for many guilds. And because of this, if your raid is going right up to the last second of the Enrage Timer, then I recommend stacking for the Spore debuff for the first Pungent Blight, and then you could ignore the Spores after that first Pungent Blight, and you could just Ice Block the second one, and then DPS all the way up until the Enrage timer. Um, if your raid DPS is good and you will kill either before the second pungent blight or within you know maybe send, uh, 10 seconds of it then I recommend not stacking at all and instead use ice block to survive the pungent blight the first one and then you just uh, don't stack for the second ones either. Um, but if your raids healers are struggling then always get the spore debuffs which will reduce the constant AoE damage and then uh, this also frees you up to use ice block if you are hit with vile gas. Um, if you are stacking, then try and move in when you have instant cast available, like their Living Bomb Refresh and Hot Street Procs, and then blink out back to whatever spot that you are positioned at. Lastly, you can Human Ratio the Vile Gas debuff, but you have to wait until it actually stuns you or it won't cleanse off the debuff if you do it too early. Rot face is pretty straightforward, but there's a few little things I'll mention. Uh, one is that you can ice block the Vile Gas debuff as well as Human Ratio it, but you do have to wait until it actually stuns you or it won't cleanse you of the debuff. Um, I've also read to not mirror image in the middle of the fight as this can screw with the little ooze's aggro table But I never experienced this issue myself because I always just pre-popped mirror images So just recommend do that. Just know that I guess that maybe is something that could happen um, Where to stand depends on your raid strategy But I like to stand in between where ooze flows can happen So that way if the pipes to your left turn on you could just cheat right a little during your instant casts and uh, Avoid being in the pool and then vice versa as well and if both happen one after another, like the one to your left and then you cheat right and then the one to your right happens, the ooze flow, the pipes turn on and the ooze flow happens, then either blink uh, laterally left or to the right to be out of them or move just temporarily a little more into the middle of the room uh, temporarily until one of the ooze flows disappears. But either way, don't stand in the middle of where an ooze flow can happen or you're going to have to move a lot in order to get out of it. On Heroic 25 Man Professor Putricide, when he transitions between phases and spawns green and orange oozes, you can snapshot the Living Bomb tick if you cast Living Bomb on the ooze of opposite of your color immediately after the ooze spawns. However, it will only snapshot the Living Bomb tick damage, as the explosion is dynamic damage, and thus the explosion will not do any damage by the time it goes off. And because of this, I don't recommend doing the snapshot with Living Bomb. Instead, just focus on your slime, and I also recommend scorching your slime for increased raid DPS, and because of the fact that all the locks could get the opposite color ooze anyways and thus it's up to the fire mages to apply the spell crit debuff on your ooze that could be the case either way just apply it right away and then everyone's stuff will benefit right away on that ooze um, if the green ooze targets you you can blink away to increase the distance it needs to travel and additionally you can ice block to bug out the green slime where it will target someone else and chase them but actually won't be able to explode on them and then when you cancel the ice block it will go back to you um, I only recommend ice blocking the green ooze in this manner if you know that there aren't enough people to soak the explosion and thus you need to do it to live. Otherwise, I think it's better to save the ice block to survive other parts of the fight or if you get low. But this is just something you can have in your back pocket um, and could definitely help you out during prog on this fight. Always make sure to keep Living Bomb up on Professor Putricide when you're DPSing the oozes, even during the transition, as damage on Professor Putricide is still valuable min-max, especially going into Phase 3. So on transitions, position yourself in between Professor Putricide and the slime spawn areas. If you're targeted by the orange ooze, then kite the orange ooze with rocket boots through the melee so that they can get some extra cleave on it, as long as the orange ooze isn't about to retarget. And also do this 
kiting with rocket boots during your instant cast such as living bomb and, and hot streak to min max your dps so get some distance on it do casts on it and then as soon as it starts to get closer you can pop rocket boots but during those instant casts get some extra distance on it continue casting it gets close to you once it gets closer you blink you know etc um, and then lastly, we never did Professor Putricide on normal, so I haven't tried to invis the gas phase stun. Um, it doesn't stun you on heroic, but I have heard that you are able to invis that stun with the right timing if you are happening to do Professor Putricide on normal. For Blood Prince Council, you want to watch the timers and keep track of who the next swap will be on. It will always rotate between all three before repeating, but it is never a set pattern. Thus, for the swap to the third target, you actually will know who it's going to be on because by the third target, it has to be that person. It always has to go through all three. You can watch the timers and start your precast on that target so that you're not losing any DPS up time because obviously if it swaps in the middle of your cast, then your fireball hits after the uh, HP has swapped to one of the other targets, then that damage is lost. Uh, additionally, don't recast Living Bomb on your current target if the target swap is about to happen, as the damage from the Living Bomb explosion and final ticks won't count if the health swap happens before then. In certain situations, it can still be worth to do the Living Bomb. So, for example, if you're DPSing Taldoram and you know that the next swap will be on Valinar and will happen in within the next 10 seconds, in that case, the Living Bomb explosion will still hit your current target and has a good chance to give a hot streak proc as well, so thus the Living Bomb refresh is worth because it's going to be hitting the two targets and the, and the target that uh, is going to have that HP swap on. For this fight, I also highly recommend 41 yard range as fire helps immensely with the Valinar phase. Make sure to blink out if you're targeted by Taldoram's Empowered Flame, and also know that Ice Block does not work on Empowered Flame, it, it, you'll, the damage will go through it. However, you can Fire Ward to help with the Absorb once you've blinked out of the stack. And then as Arcane, you can Fire Ward the Empowered Flame Soaks and Glittering Sparks for extra Encanter Absorption procs if you are in uh, IA on this fight, although I highly recommend Range Talents on this fight, and so then you might have to give up IA for that. Blink does not give stacks of Shadow Prison, so even if high on Shadow Prison stacks, you still can fix positioning with Blink as long as you don't tap WASD at all. And then also Ice Block removes stacks of Shadow Prison if you need to remove them in that way. Lastly, Living Bomb Explosions don't hit the Dark Nucleus, so don't worry about pulling aggro on them in that way. For Blood Queen, Fire Mage scales really well with the Vampire buff, so it's best to have Mages prioed higher in the Bite order, and if you are getting bit first through Misdirect and Tricked on you for Threat, then save your CDs until you are first bitten for that best min-max. Know that you can block off the Swarming Shadows debuff which drops fire beneath you, but during prog if your healers are struggling then I recommend saving Ice Block for the air phase when healers aren't going to be able to keep up on everyone. Uh, you can uh, Human Racial the air phase fear. Also blink into the center of the room if you get packed with Dark Fallen, and then use Instant Cast to move back to your position. Another tip we used is we delayed the very first bite until the last second of when the, before the person was about to be mind controlled so that the bites are offset from the air phase. And if you just do that with that very first one, it helps offset having a bite go out during the air phase. However, it also delays all of your later bites as well. So if you're struggling with the DPS check, then maybe you don't do this, but it does help with that uh, survivability during the air phase from the AOE damage going out while also having to do a bite. And then lastly, you can get bit while you're ice blocked. So this is helpful if you are low on HP, say during an air phase, someone needs to bite you or they're gonna be MC'd. Then you can ice block to live, they can bite you. You still get the essence of the Blood Queen debuff, you just won't take the bite damage. Dream Walker is a pretty simple fight, but there's a few things. Uh, first is to make sure you put Amplify Magic on the boss. Um, for this fight, I also prefer FFB spec for because the you know, fight is pretty long, so it helps on mana being FFB. And it's also easier to get Dragon's Breath, Blast Wave, and Fire Starter as FFP as compared to Fire TTW. Uh, but that said, it's, it's definitely not needed. It's not really a difficult fight for DPS, so you could just certainly do it as Fire TTW. And if you're Fire TTW, you could uh, focus magic your Holy Paladin, which would help heal up the boss more. So you could go either spec, I just kind of preferred FFP for it. Um, there's really not much to be said for this fight, just Pryo Skeletons and Suppressors, AoE the Rot Worms for Pad, uh, avoid the knockup from the Mar Archmages, and the only thing I could really reliably living bomb where the explosion would go off before the ad would die was the A-bombs. Everything else just typically would die before the living bomb would explode, but, you know, adjust for your raid environment. Okay, Cindergosa. First thing I want you to do is mentally prepare yourself for the worst caster fight in the entire game. Okay, with that said, it helps to have 7 plus healers on this fight for phase 3, and on the PTR we only utilize lesser flask of resistance, but apparently frost resist gear during early prog on this fight can really help your healers out a lot for phase 3. 
Uh, it's not necessary, but it makes phase three a lot more forgiving. So, you know, once you've been in ICC for a month or more, you have more ICC gear, your healers have phase three down more, um, then it's, you know, probably not needed to have that fraudulent disc gear. So if you're watching this from the future, keep that in mind. But for early progression, it can definitely help. I recommend getting the frost resist ring and then either the belt or the boots or both. I would replace whichever item is lower eye level between your boots and belt, and then you could also select the one that doesn't have hit on it so you don't have to worry about hit concerns. In my case, for my Mage Sith, both my belt and boots have hit on it, so I'm doing the Frost Resist Ring and then the Frost Resist Belt, and that way I can toss three Rigid King's Ambers into the belt and it replaces all the hit that I'll be losing. Next, follow your raid strat for Unchained Magic. So before the final phase, we would stand out of the stack and cast, but we would only do a few casts and that was it, as DPS largely doesn't matter until the final phase. And in the final phase, we never cast it with the debuff, as it's too much raid damage when you're getting the debuff stacks plus the instability explosion, even if the explosion is only hitting you with you standing out. So we just would never cast. Uh, you know, but do whatever your raid strat is. That said, you can perform an instant cast immediately after a fireball cast and you'll only get one stack of unchained magic. So if you are allowed to stand out and cast, make sure you're doing that and you're just gonna get you less instability explosion casts. And then you can also start a cast while you have unchained magic and as long as the cast finishes after the debuff falls off, then you won't get an instability explosion stack. Because if you didn't know, the unchained magic is a separate debuff than the actual explosion one, right? The unchained magic debuff, that's what gives you the explosion debuffs if you cast while you have Unchained Magic, but they're two separate debuffs. It goes without saying, but you can Ice Block off Unchained Magic, but you want to save Ice Block for Phase 3 so that you can Ice Block off that Unchained Magic in that Phase 3 where it's the only phase where DPS really matters. Uh, you can Ice Block in Phase 1 if it's like the very first Unchained Magic that goes out, as Ice Block will come off CD by the time you get to Phase 3, so then you'll still have it again. But outside of that, just save your Ice Block for Phase 3. And also, if you are in Phase 3 and you get Unchained Magic in the middle of casting and your cast finishes and then you get a stack of the Instability Explosion debuff, then blink out of the stack. By blinking out you'll get a second stack of instability but it will ensure the explosion won't hit anyone else and then if ice block is up you can of course safely ice block out of the raid to get rid of the unchained magic and explosion stacks but know that the reason you can't just ice block in the middle of the raid is when you ice block when you have uh, instability explosion stack the instability explosion instantly goes off then so you do have to be out of the raid when you ice block in order for it to be safe Another tip is if you don't have Unchained Magic, you can Frost Ward to help survive the Air Phase Frost Beacons as well as the Final Phase Beacons. Um, when it comes to the Air Phase, what I like to do is I stand in the middle and cast Arcane Explosion. So jump during your Arcane Explosion to give you that extra range through Leeway to ensure you hit all six tombs. And then stop AoE when some of them start to get close to 20% and then just single target down the high HP blocks. And after the fourth Frost Bomb goes out, AE and Sapper or Serenite Bomb in order to break the last people free. Finally, in phase three, mainly just focus Cindergosa and only focus tombs when your raid falls behind on them. That said, still living bomb the frost tombs and use your instant cast to move between the tombs. The pulse debuff goes out every six seconds, so when your debuff has like three or three to four seconds left on it, that's when you need to duck back behind an ice block to have it, your debuff stacks drop off. Ideally, you blast with one debuff stack and then drop it. So try to never be above one stack of the debuff, but just keep blasting. You can get one debuff stack, and then when you have about three to four seconds left on that debuff stack, hop behind the tomb, drop it, and then go back to blasting her. And if you're arcane on Cindergosa, then be using Frost Ward off CD to be helping get those juicy IA and Frost Warding procs. Good luck, and it goes without saying, everyone hates this fight, but hey, at least she uh, can drop our biggest trinket in the entire game. For Lich King, the first thing is that magic absorption is a must on this fight. So you basically need to be Fire TTW or Arcane, and I highly recommend Fire TTW. So, but just make sure you have magic absorption to help out the healers. Uh, next, you want enough HP so that when you're hit with Infest with a Power Word Shield on you from your Dispreeze, you'll still be above 90% HP and then not take the ticking damage from the Infest. And so for this, I used a few Glowing Dreadstones to make sure I had that much HP. But that said, it's up to you to figure out this situation for you because it's going to vary based on your Dispreeze gear. Because the more SP they have, the bigger their shields are going to be at a 1.5 coefficient from what I understand, and then the, thus the less HP that you'll need to be above that 90% HP. But know that the Disc Priest shields will also vary with your Demo Locks Pact buff, so be conservative and gem enough stamina so that you'll be above 90% HP even with a weaker Power Word shield from them. And also know that you cannot reduce the infest damage with Dampen Magic at all. Dampen Magic doesn't affect it, it has no coefficient. 
For phase one, we have range stand out and spread for minimal movement in phase one to have higher uptime on the boss. And then if your raid wants you to, you can living bomb the ghouls for extra single target DPS on Lich King, but we didn't do that so that Baron could have those ghouls to pass the plague debuff to to make sure they weren't dying or anything like that or any aggro issues. Um, I don't recommend it unless your guild has a strat where it's okay to living bomb them, so just keep that in mind, it's, it's up to you and your raid strat. Uh, for phase 1.5, obviously living bomb the spirits, but always focus the newest spawned raging spirit for maximum DPS on them through cleave. Help out with the spheres at the end of phase 1.5 and the 2.5 transitions, even if the, that's not an assignment to you, just always focus them immediately after the transition so that that doesn't wipe your raid. For the Valks, living bomb the Valks and spread the pyre dot between them for maximum DPS and only sapper if you don't have a power word shield on you or the infest has just gone out. Otherwise your sapper will damage the power word shield and then the infest will put you under 90% HP which is going to be a pain for healers. Uh, do not use blink if defile is within the next 15 seconds. Always save blink in case defile is cast on you as you can blink to negate one of the mechanics responsible for many wipes on this fight. Know that the Enrage timer is a thing on this fight until we get a lot more ICC gear, so use your CDs as they come up. That said, save your DPS potion for a triple Valk grab to ensure you can help break all three Valks free. This is an extremely long fight, so in order to make it all the way through without going oom, you need to time your evocates correctly. So you want to evocate during the transition. So you want to use like one or no mana gem uses in phase one, and then you evocate in phase 1.5. And then with mana gem uses and evo in phase 2.5, you should make it to phase 3 with enough mana, and then you can also reconjure your mana gem while you're down in the throne room. If you get to phase 3, just make sure you're ice lancing the wicked spirits inside Frostmourne. And then unfortunately, we never made it to phase 3, so I don't have anything more here. I'll be making a separate, another video on Lich King, or maybe just include it in the parse guide when that eventually comes out uh, for more details on, on Lich King. But yeah, we haven't made it to phase 3, we haven't killed him yet, so there's still a lot more to learn. So apologies that there isn't more here. The one last thing I'll mention here is that it is possible to blink back from a Valk grab if they get you beyond the ledge. I hope to have a video out on that out on that soon and the whole investigation into it um, but at this time it does not seem to be reliable basically the tldr is that you hold right click while mashing both left click and blink and you want the blink to cast immediately after the valk lets you go so this is similar to blinking immediately after dismounting where you then blink forward through the air instead of straight down however the blink timing for this is very tight as a blink delayed even 50 milliseconds after a dismount won't go straight through the air so that said the major rita who got this to work on the ptr was playing from eu with 100 milli 180 millisecond ping so you know who knows but anyways good luck on this fight if you start to work on it on heroic and obviously on normal it's not really a gimme either a lot of these things will apply for normal as well as far as just general tips and tricks but uh, normal is a lot more forgiving but either way yeah still blink out with the file and all those kind of things good luck and i hope you do well in icc cheers that's mine sorry second square 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 yeah get ready here help yep. stones do whatever you can it's already in oh and i got picked up too <laughs> that's my bad. Uh, where the are they marked what the oh, fuck was that? Is it because hands is dead? Weak warriors were broke. That's cool. Yeah, I missed the AM shadow. Sorry. Did I let you take out hands? I think I did. Um, let me see. No, it might have been the ghouls. The arms of an angel. Oh, you. All the ghouls were on me. Uh, what? The Cassie res me on the collapsing platform. Was that? From my perspective, one, there was my maybe one or two dead. goals there because of the... From uh, my perspective, the Jedi are evil!